let's talk about insomnia. Hi, I'm pharmacist Jamie. I have a doctorate in pharmacy and I've been working in the field for over a decade now and I'm here to help you live your healthiest life. A big part of living a healthy life is getting a good night's rest. Unfortunately, a large chunk of the population is not getting a good night's rest, and a lot of people are turning to supplements and medications in order to make up that deficit. But these medications and supplements are not without long-term risks and side effects. So let's get into it from a pharmacist perspective. I'm gonna talk about prescription medications first. The thing that normally jumps to people's minds is Ambien or Zolpidem. That is in the hypnotic drug class along with Lunesta and also Zaliplon. We call these the non-benzo benzos in the pharmacy world because they have selective receptors. So they won't be hitting all of the same receptors as some other benzodiazepines like the muscle relaxing effects and the anti-anxiety effects. You won't really see those in these medications. These are selective more just for sleep. Now I will say that out of all of the prescription medications available for sleep, these probably have the best evidence compared to a placebo, but they are not without risks and side effects. Number one, these medications come with a black box warning for complex sleep behaviors. So those stories you hear about people driving in their sleep, eating in their sleep, sleepwalking, that is what is associated with these medications. Another thing I think most patients are not conscientious about enough is that the dosing is different for women or for older individuals. The 10 milligrams should really be reserved for younger men. If you are a woman or if you are over the age of 65, if you take these medications at all, it really should be at the lower dose, the five milligram. Another thing I think people should be aware of with these medications is that they work best on an empty stomach. You should not have eaten anything for several hours before taking these medications. If you take these medications after eating, it's going to cause them to have a delayed onset of action, which means that you're go they're gonna start working much later. You're gonna get to bed later. That's not what we're looking for here in trying to treat insomnia. Now, as far as differentiating between these three different hypnotic medications, Lunesta has a longer half-life, so it has more of a chance of making you feel groggier in the morning. But Lunesta and Ambien don't work exactly the same way, even though they're in the same drug class. So if you don't respond to one, you may respond better to another one. The Zaliplon has a very short duration of action. So a lot of times that one will be used for middle of the night wakenings. In fact, I often see patients who are taking like an Ambien every night and then they get maybe like 10 pills of Zaliplon as well to take as needed for middle of the night wakenings. Ambien does come in several forms. It comes in the immediate release. So that's more like if you have trouble getting to sleep. It comes in the controlled release. So that's more like if you have trouble waking up in the middle of the night. And it also comes in like the ones that you can put under your tongue or the sprays, which can also help with middle of the night wakenings that are intended to be used as needed if you wake up in the middle of the night. Please note that all of the clinical trials involving these medications are short-term studies only. This is not the way that I see these medications being used. Generally, once someone gets on one of these hypnotic medications, they're on it forever and ever and ever. I almost never see someone just having like a one or two week or four week trial of this med, which is what all of the clinical trials are testing. So that is of great concern to me as far as the long-term effects of these medications. We don't really know yet because there aren't any long-term studies that we can really dive into the data and get a hang of. So please just be conscientious of that and know that there might be long-term side effects that we don't really see yet because no one's doing that data. They're marketing these medications as short-term medications. That's the FDA approval for them, but everyone I know uses them long-term, so that's a little sketchy. Another class of medications that we often see prescribed for insomnia are antidepressants. Here's looking at you, trazodone. Yeah, trazodone is an antidepressant, but I definitely see it more often used as something to help people get to sleep. The thing I like about trazodone is that it has less side effects than a lot of the other sleeping medications. Um, it does come with a few risks, orthostatic hypotension. So that's basically if you stand up too fast, you can pass out. Um, we've had a couple serious situations happen with that that I have personally seen in my patients. Um, priapism is another thing that can happen. 
So be aware of those side effects. I think that this is a decent option for people who have depression and insomnia. Um, trazodone can kind of cover both of those. A lot of times we'll see it used in conjunction with an SSRI. Very common and seems to help a lot of people. Another antidepressant that we will often see prescribed for sleep is doxepin. It's usually at a lower dose, more like three to six milligrams. Uh, this does have a longer half-life, so I think that it tends to show more grogginess in the morning for a lot of people. We can also see dry mouth and hypertension issues with this medication. Just a few things to be aware of there. Mirtazapine we will sometimes see prescribed for sleep. Interestingly enough with this medication, uh, the sleeping portion works better at lower doses. So if you take a higher dose of mirtazapine, you are less likely to experience the sleepiness that comes with it. So I just find that really interesting and weird about mirtazapine. Um, a lot of people shy away from this option because it does tend to cause appetite increase and weight gain. So please be aware of that with mirtazapine. But if a patient has issues with wanting to gain weight, and also insomnia, this is certainly an option that they can look into. Okay, let's talk about the elephant in the room, benzodiazepines. So that's basically going to be the medications that end in PAM or LAM. So triazolam is one. Um, we pretty much only see that prescribed for like procedures. It has a really short half-life between two to six hours, so that's not gonna be effective for, get you, for getting you a full night's rest. Um, and then also temazepam, that's probably the most common one that I see prescribed for sleep. These medications come with a black box warning for dependence and tolerance. So about half the people who take these medications will become physically dependent and tolerant to them, which means you have to increase your dose to get the same effect. Also, rebound insomnia is really, really bad with these medications. So if you quit taking them, you're gonna have like double the insomnia that you had before you ever started taking them. It's just a really, really unfortunate thing. Um, patients will also go through withdrawals when they stop taking these, really, really unpleasant. These medications are also associated with higher risks of death, especially if you are combining them with any type of opiate, alcohol, any other sedative, these will cause respiratory depression and work synergistically along with those other respiratory depressors. It can be super, super dangerous, you guys. Something that is really important to note about benzodiazepines is that when you are taking these medications, you're usually not experiencing the deeper stages of sleep. So people like them because they take it and boom, they pass out. That's great. They're not tossing and turning. They love that. But they don't realize that they are not getting into the deeper REM sleep, the really restorative sleep that makes a big difference for our physical and mental health. Benzodiazepines just do not allow you to get into that. And that's kind of the whole purpose of getting a good night's rest. So I just don't like these medications for sleep. So let's talk about non-prescription things that people do for sleep. Up first is a little bit of self-medicating with alcohol and or cannabis THC. Um, I see people do this a lot and the thing about that is, once again, we see a similar thing that you do with the benzos where they do help you fall asleep quickly, but you are not getting to the deeper restorative REM sleep. So what's interesting about this is that a lot of people who quit using alcohol or who quit using THC cannabis, they start getting really, really vivid dreams and nightmares. It's because their body is like catching up on all that REM sleep that they have not been getting. I just find that really interesting. Now, if you have ever been to my channel before, then you probably already know my least favorite medication that I rant about all the time, coming back here full circle, that is z -Quil aka Benadryl, aka Diphenhydramine. Now this medication is fine to use occasionally for an allergic reaction, for example, or if you only need to get to sleep once, twice, three times a month, fine. 
But the problem with diphenhydramine daily use is that it stops working within just a few days. Within about seven days, it's no longer working. That drowsiness side effect that people love that helps them get to sleep quickly just disappears. Your body becomes tolerant to it. So if you use this medication for longer than a week or so, you are just experiencing the placebo effect. It's not really working for sleep anymore. Now, a lot of times people will say to me then, okay, so it's a placebo, fine, it's working for me, I'm gonna keep using it, it's just a placebo. But guys, it's not a placebo, okay? It's a medication and it comes with long-term side effects. The most serious side effect being that it is linked to dementia. So when we see clinical trials where patients are using this medication nightly for three years or more, they are at a higher risk for dementia or Alzheimer's. It's not just a sugar pill, you guys. It has consequences. So please do not use this medication nightly for sleep. And the same things go for Unisom, okay? Those are both in the antihistamine class. They both have the anticholinergic effects. Also, they're really, really unsafe to use in older people. Older people eliminate this medication much less effectively than younger people, so they are especially dangerous in senior individuals. Now there are some supplements that do perform slightly better than a placebo. They're not gonna change your life. They're not gonna make you pass out instantly like some of the medications that we've already discussed, but it's better than nothing. And we're talking about how wonderful the placebo effect is. These are generally safe to take nightly. Please check in with your doctor before using these because they're not for everyone, but they are safe for a lot of people. That's gonna be melatonin, 5-HTP, valerian root, or magnesium, okay? Those are four supplements that you can consider incorporating into your routine. You can find um, supplements that have multiples of these combined. I personally take one that has melatonin, 5-HTP, and magnesium. It does help me, okay? and it does not come with the long-term risks and side effects that the Benadryl and that some of the prescription medications come with. So now some really cool food hacks that can help you sleep are chamomile. This wonderful tea performs better than a placebo to help you get some rest. Also almonds high in magnesium. Kiwi has serotonin in it, which promotes good sleep. And tart cherries are one of the very few foods that naturally contain melatonin. Very interesting. Melatonin decreases a lot as we age. So that is a big reason why older adults have more trouble sleeping. So supplementing that or trying to get some tart cherries into your diet, something to that effect, might just help. The thing that truly has the most evidence to help you get a good night's rest, however, is sleep hygiene and or cognitive behavioral therapy. People absolutely hate when I say that because it's hard work, you guys, but it's well worth it. If you wanna talk about evidence-based practice, sleep hygiene wins every time when it comes to insomnia. So this is going to include things like going to bed and waking up at the same time every day, not sleeping in on weekends or staying up late for a party, whatever. Also keeping your room cool and dark, keeping your clothes comfortable, having a bedtime routine, especially one that involves self-care, uh, self like a nice warm bath, some chamomile tea, wonderful. You're also going to want to not eat or drink right before going to bed. Drinking right before bed can cause you to wake up all night to pee, and then eating right before bed also can disturb your sleep and make you not fall asleep as quickly. Try to stay away from technology. And if you find that you do not fall asleep within 20 minutes of getting into bed, the suggestion is that you get up out of bed, do something else, and then try to get back into bed when you feel more sleepy. Meditation and relaxation techniques can be wonderful here. You can Google how to do those. There are also cognitive behavioral specialists and sleep specialists who deal specifically with this. They are wonderful. They can absolutely change your life. I know that cost can be a barrier for those things. So believe it or not, you can actually turn up a lot of this with a Google search or self-help books that can teach you how to sleep better. 
Okay, so this was my first time trying to do one of these longer form YouTube videos. You guys know I normally do like the minute long shorts. Um, that's just what I'm used to. So let me know if you enjoyed this, if you'd like to see more of these deeper dives, kind of discussing these more at length. Um, and let me know what topics you want me to talk about. Like I said, I'm here to help you live your healthiest life. So I wanna talk about what interests you and what you wanna know more about from a pharmacist perspective. Okay, well, I hope that you have have a great day and a wonderful, restful night. See you soon.